there, it's Arlen and Elsa Salty, and this is the Break Forth Journeys podcast. This is the podcast that brings you from the comfort of your home to walk the pages of Scripture in the very lands of the Bible. Most of these recordings are from our main spiritual teacher for all of our Break Forth Journeys tours, the renowned award-winning author from Sweden, Reverend Hans Weisbrot. But before we get into our show today, we want to invite you to join us for one or more of our spiritual journeys to the lands of the Bible. Every tour sells out, so please ask for your free brochures today at BreakforthJourneys.com. Now let's get started. We're here now in Corinth. It's where Paul met Priscilla and Aquila, who became faithful believers and helped Paul through other missionary journeys. Listen as Hans gives a message on expanding the kingdom of God in ministry. Now, here's Hans. I would like to, uh, first I just want to start with quickly um, just uh, reading the text that speaks about when Paul came to Corinth, what actually happened. Uh, And we have it in Acts chapter 18 from verse 1. Acts 18 from verse 1, it goes like this. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila. Yes. Aquila. 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 A native of Pontus. Black Sea. Yeah. Black Sea. Pontus. I hope I pronounced it right. Who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. And you already mentioned that. So you know that. Uh, Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker, as also uh, you already have been pointing out so well, as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Every Sabbath, he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. And you have seen a stone connected to the synagogue, right? Yeah. Uh, well, the, the thing we just can note here is that uh, a couple of things that can be very good for you when it comes to... to um, how we are to expand the kingdom of God uh, in our ministry. We can get a, a, a couple of, of good pieces of advice here from Paul. And, and number one is that Paul connects with key persons. And you know, it wasn't 10,000, it wasn't 10, it wasn't 12 as, as Jesus had. It was how many? Two. Two. So they were all together three. Sometimes we often are so troubled that we are not so many. Perhaps not in Canada, but in Sweden. We often think about that. But don't look for, for, for a certain number of people. Look for the right people. Look for the key persons that God kind of leads you to. Um, uh, and um, then you can see that, that uh, Paul, he, he has a job that he uses as a platform for his ministry. So... so that is also something for us to keep in mind. Many of us are not working full time as ministers or, or, or in the church as, as hired staff. Well, then we are very much similar to how Paul lived his life. He had a, an a, a, a ordinary job. I've been trying to walk around here to kind of prophetically feel, you know, what shop Paul had. But I haven't, you know, I haven't felt anything specific anywhere. But, but just imagine that Paul had one of these shops. It's kind of mind boggling. Uh, and then, uh, every Sabbath, he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. Well, he had one, he had one specific point of time where he went to the synagogue. I asked the personnel at the museum when I was here last time, where did they find the stones? And they found the stones down on the Lachayan Road. It doesn't tell us necessarily that the synagogue was there, but it might be the, the highest chance down there. So he had a certain spot, and perhaps that's the way we, it is in our life too. That, that many things in our life, uh, uh, we, we go about, and, and the Lord is there, and there's a, there's, a, there's a silent peace about all of it. But then we have a certain point of time, perhaps every week, where God opens up something for us. Well, that is very similar to Paul. That was the way he started here. Uh, so we shouldn't despise, as it says in Zechariah chapter 4, we shouldn't suspise the small beginnings. This was how the foundation was laid before revival broke out. So do not despise the small beginnings. Do not despise 
uh, uh, um, the things that God does that might not be so, so impressingly when it comes to statistics, but it's very, very important when it comes to significance from God's point of view. Uh, and then we have verse 5. When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. And I'll only read that verse before we go on to the Bema here. And I think this verse is interesting. Uh, once again, when Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. And what that tells us is, um, the Greek text can be understood as, that when, when, when they too came, they started to pitch in and help Paul with the work. See? So that enabled Paul to be able to give it all for the gospel. You see? And that's also something that can happen at, at, at some points of time. You know, Timothy and Silas, they could have been filled with envy. You know what envy is? Yeah. You have a problem with that in Canada? <laughs> yes. No. You know, when the green color starts to come, you look yourself in the mirror and say, why am I so green? That can be envy, right? So they could have been filled with envy, you know, fellow, I should preach just as much as Paul, you know. Why is Paul getting this, you know, open door? Why not we? They, they thought quite the opposite. When they came here, they thought like this. This is a mature Christian thought. They thought, how can we serve the kingdom best? What can we do that will promote the kingdom of God best? They didn't think first about what they felt like. They f the, the first prayer and instinct was, you know, how can I serve the kingdom best? And then they started to, to, to work together with Paul. And I, I'm sure that they preached also. I'm sure that they evangelized lots and so on. But still, they, they, in the beginning, they laid their main focus on uh, freeing Paul, so to speak, so he could be fully absorbed into the things that God was opening up for him. That's mature Christianity, I would say. Imagine if, if the body of Christ in Sweden and in Canada could, could, could uh, or I, I speak about Sweden now, I, I don't know about Canada, but imagine if the body of Christ in Sweden could, could be a little bit more mature and, and, and a little more have that kingdom focus, how we work together the best as a team. I think we would have revival very soon in Sweden then. I really do so. Uh, so that's, that's uh, uh, a thing about uh, Paul's time in Corinth. But now I want to speak briefly also about the Bema here. Because uh, I told you already when we celebrated communion, how I think that God often used uh, the everyday environment for the prophets and the apostles as, as a foundation from, from which God uh, started to reveal what he wanted to give a specific revelation to, to, to be there in the word of God, right? And the fascinating, fascinating thing is that in the letter to Romans, uh, Paul uses the word Bema. Perhaps you're aware of that. He uses the word Bema in a very specific way. And, and you have been telling us about the Bema already, that this was not only the judgment seat. This was the place, you know, from where the procurator uh, gave announcements. And also, this was the place from where you would have an award ceremony. If you came up to get a medal, you could, you could receive it here. So this was not only a judgment seat, this was uh, uh, the place for, for the announcements and to receive the awards. Right? And, and uh, when we come to the Roman, the letter to Romans, chapter 12... Oh, oh sorry, I'm only <laughs> seeing that you are awake. Chapter 14... <laughs> yeah, no, that's too much, but, but, but all that's the right direction. Uh, Romans 14, uh, Paul writes like this. Uh, he, he, uh, and I read from the English translation here. Uh, I think I have uh, NIV, do you call it that? Yeah. yeah, New International Version. It goes like this. And, and imagine just how the Holy Spirit, he, he speaks through this. And then Paul writes like this, Romans 14, verse 10. You then, why do you judge your brother or sister? Or why do you treat them with contempt? For we all, we will all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, 
As surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me, every time will acknowledge God, so then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. Now, when it says, uh, when it is translated here, God's judgment seat, in Greek, what does it say? We will stand, we will stand one day in front of God's bima. You see? But now, you see, Paul, he has been writing so much in the letter uh, already about that we receive no judgment, no condemnation, even though we would deserve, we all deserve to be, 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 be judged guilty, right? But because of Jesus' death on the cross, his atoning blood through righteousness alone, by grace alone, by, by faith in Jesus alone, through that, by grace, we receive forgiveness, right? So, so the, 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 the judgment part of it all has already been taken care of. Are you happy for that? Amen. Yes, yes. yes. That's a good news, right? Yes, that's good news. So, so, therefore, I'm, I'm kind of, you know, I, I'm not sure if judgment seat is the correct translation of BMA here. Uh, uh, I would say that perhaps a more, more uh, theologically correct translation would be, we will all stand before God's throne. Yes. Because that's what this is. This is a throne. This is a place from where you spoke out uh, uh, what you had announcements and also giving awards. And then go, Paul says, and I will finish with this. What he says is, verse 12, so then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. And now I go, oh wait, Hans, is it trouble again? Now you, already, you said before we receive forgiveness, even though we don't deserve it, right? So it's not about judgment. It's not about heaven or hell. Jesus has taken care of that, right? We need to put our faith in Jesus and then he saves us from going to hell to heaven, right? Amen? Amen. So, what the Bema is about, what Paul is saying, the, the message that the Holy Spirit gives him, and, and this is another moment among the trees here, that my prayer is that you will never forget about this. Not because I say it, but because it's there in the Word. God says, uh, uh, Paul says in Catalogon, when it says that we should give account of our lives. And that's a financial term, to, to, show what, you know, to show your account. When we get to heaven, my friends, there is no sin left. Jesus took it on the cross. So, it will be like, you know, you know how you, you, you made pictures before? Mm -hmm. You had negatives? And you have these rooms, dark rooms, you, we call it. You say dark rooms? Dark room. Dark room, right? Well, the thing is that all the sins, it's like, you know, you are, you are producing pictures and, and someone opens the door. And what happens with the pictures? They disappear in the light. So in Jesus' atoning blood, all the sins are gone when you get to heaven. You grateful for that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Now comes the little challenge here. Grace is wonderful. That's the whole foundation. There will be no, you know, no fishings. Uh, God won't remind us of our sins. But, there is a but. A graceful but. A loving but. What, what Paul is saying here, and in other places as well, in the New Testament, for example, 2 Corinthians, is that he's telling us that when we get to heaven, only by grace alone, God, the triune God, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, He will walk through our lives together with us. And we will see then what fruit our lives have produced. You see? You agree with me? Yes. Amen. And, and I don't know about you, but, but for me, I need that kind of message. Because I'm so carnal, and I'm not saying it to sound good to you, I, I, you know, ask my wife. I need that message. I, you know, I need that um, as, a, as a pebble in my shoe. Could you say it like that? Do you have a pebble in your, have you had a pebble in your shoe sometime? Yeah. You know, it reminds you constantly. I need that reminder every day that, you know, Hans, how are you to focus now in your life? How are you to, you know, are, are you to, to, to uh, 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 live your life in a selfish, selfish way with your money, with your time, with your efforts, uh, uh, the way you, you choose what to do or not to do? Or are you to live for Christ, with the day of Christ in front of you, and thinking about that one day, He will walk through your life together with you. So therefore, I hope that you will never forget that, that you one, one time in Corinth, you, you visited the Bema, the reminder that God will, will, will walk through your life together with you. I just want to say before we finish here, is that 
you know, we often think when we get to heaven that it's all about statistics. <laughs> no. But it's not. The, the key word, I think, yeah. is not statistics. Sure. The key not. word is your heart. And if I were to choose one word, it would be faithfulness. Faithfulness. And you know what we will find out? I think we'll be amazed. When we get to heaven, we will be amazed when we see, you know, what it meant every moment in our life when we did the thing because we did it for Christ. We will first then see the enormous significance only by grace that that has meant for many, many, many other people. Care of, right? Yeah. And no grief in heaven, eh? Yeah. But at the same time, I don't know about you, but I, I repeat once again, mostly for myself, that I need to be reminded uh, pretty often that Christ is walking through my life. I need that pebble in my shoe because otherwise I tend to make other choices in my life. That's I do it lots great. anyways. <laughs> so it's joyous, but it's, it's a pebble in the shoe at the same time and that's wonderful. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Break Forth Journeys podcast. We pray you were richly blessed. Before we leave you today, we want to remind you that you can experience an incredible spiritual journey of a lifetime to the lands of the Bible with Hans as your spiritual teacher at virtually every biblical site on the tour. We also serve as leaders as well as leading in times of worship and prayer along the way. As you can imagine, Having Hans as your teacher, every tour sells out, sometimes a year or more in advance. If you'd like to learn more about our tours, see beautiful photos of the Holy Lands, read blog posts about new discoveries, as well as to receive a free copy of our book, The Christian Pilgrim's Insider's Guide, please head over to BreakForthJourneys.com. Until next time, may God richly bless you day by day.